Father, thank you, Lord, for this time tonight, for everyone here, Lord, and the fact that uh, we're still able to gather together, Lord, uh, not persecuted or lightly persecuted, Lord, as it is here in the States, but we're able to come around your word, Lord, and just hear from you. So, Father, I pray that you would be present with each one of us tonight, Lord. Help me to teach your word clearly, Lord, not to twist it, not to inject my own opinion, Lord, where you speak clearly. And uh, just may your spirit be on us, Lord, and just teach us how to suffer well tonight. Help us, Lord, help those around the world, Lord, especially your persecuted church, thinking of those in Afghanistan right now, Lord. Uh, Father, precious in the sight, in your sight, is the death of your saints, Lord, and help us to, uh, to learn to live like that, Lord, if possible. So, Father, help us and be with us tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. So, First Peter chapter four, specifically towards the end of the book, uh, verses twelve through nineteen tonight. So, starting in verse twelve, the word of God reads, "Beloved." Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So, <clears throat> just a quick background for uh, this, this epistle. It's obviously written by the Apostle Peter, uh, Simon Peter. And it's written during the time, um, I believe, after either during Nero or a little after Nero, around 64, 68 AD. So it's either during Nero or Dom Domitian. I'm not entirely positive. But either way, the period of time, there was great persecution um, in the area. And he's written it to uh, the, I think in verse, not verse one, chapter one, it says, to the exiles of the dispersion. So this is his audience in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Um, he's writing to believers kind of sporadically spread out who have been persecuted. Um, so he's writing to believers, so this is written to us. So he starts in verse 12. Beloved, good title for, for believers, right? Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So Peter, right off the gate here, he tells us that trials, even deep fiery trials they're not to be treated as strange but they come to test us so trials for the christian are the norm uh, here in the states we have a little backwards comfort tends to be the norm for us um, granted as i'm studying this I'm like lord this is making me a little uncomfortable because we like our comfort let's be real i mean we like our comfort we don't like when the pressure's put on we don't like when we're maligned or someone gives us a weird look when we say that you know we love the lord and, and stuff like that um but i mean here our persecution is like so light it's yeah you know it, it's almost nothing um that's not to say that there aren't varying degrees of persecution and that uh you know we don't really suffer on uh this side so but uh, again suffering is the norm for for us as believers not the exception um, that doesn't mean we go out seeking it that just means that it's you know when we're walking faithfully it's going to happen if we're following Christ if we're being like Christ 
Christ suffered greatly for doing everything sinlessly. It's going, if we're like him and echoing him, it's going to, to come to us as well. Right. That's just the nature of things. So how we react, though, to suffering can really show us what's in our hearts. Again, my initial reaction, Lord, I like my comfort. Is comfort an idol? Maybe. You know? How is it, though? Well, only we know. We have to have that conversation before the Lord. Lord, is comfort an idol to me? If it is, put it to that. So, but again, too, think of how you guys deal with, with suffering or how you've seen others deal with suffering. You know, we, listen, we are in, we are blessed to be in this particular body, in this particular congregation here at Grace, because we are not just a happy, clappy church. You know, we, we come in, you have all sides of people going just through life. You have people that are absolutely radiant with joy, but then you have people going through really personal, difficult trials. And nobody here in our congregation is afraid to show those things. You know, I've seen, I've seen solid brothers and sisters just weeping over things that they're going through, you know, over the trials and then over the faithfulness of the Lord through those trials as they come out of it or as they're going through. So we're not we're not the norm i would say we're truly biblical here and it's it, it's a blessing to see in our congregation yeah. so like as i'm trying to think like lord what would you have me teach on i'm thinking of you know current events and everything going on but then i'm also thinking like this is really applicable to this congregation because we're real here <laughs> you know so but again too how we react to suffering can also show us what's in our hearts and each one of us deals with suffering in various ways uh you know common gut reaction at least for me is to avoid it i want to run i want to suppress it i want to I'll, I'll deal with this later i don't want to do, do this now you know um but it suffering in, in pain because guys let's be real suffering hurts uh you know saying that christians go through suffering is also acknowledging that it's painful just because we're believers doesn't suspend uh, you know, pain and, and uh, you know, anguish over the trials that we're going through. Uh, it, it's real, but that, we'll see that that shows how faithful the Lord is to us. But speaking of the Lord and, and suffering in general, we can have the adverse reaction, and, and you see this with some unbelievers too, where it can call into question the character of God due to suffering. Um, there's many that walk around with, uh, like considering the problem of evil. Oh, if, if God is all good and all powerful, then why does he allow suffering in the world? Why does a newborn have cancer or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, pick, pick whatever trial and, and just put it, put it on the board. Somebody is going to make some objection. Um, and, you know, it, it is a problem. It's, you look at it and right off the bat, yeah, that's a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, there's a lot of pain and in, in, in everything in there, but does that mean that because we suffer that God is not all powerful or that he's not all good and not all loving? No, no. But for, for the unregenerate heart and the unregenerate mind, it, it will call into question the character of God. Um, so again, the problem of evil, it's something that we have to know how to answer. Um, but both Peter and Jesus kind of answer this or they address this question. Peter, um, he says that trials or sufferings are here to test us. If you, sorry, good. If you open up to 1 Peter 4, uh, verses 1 through 5, Peter says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. 
but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So that's Peter. Jesus addresses the same thing in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. He says, There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. Now that's only recorded there. Uh, we have no other background into that, what, exactly what happened uh, as far as the scriptures say. So, but go in from verse 2. And he answered them. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Were those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So... The problem of evil, it, so often when that's called into question, when especially like an unbeliever will go, oh, well, if God's, you know, so good and so loving, you know, why doesn't he stop this evil thing from happening or that evil thing? It's, we, we can address that to the unbeliever if we're witnessing to them or just whatever. We're out in the world, we're having a conversation with somebody and they bring that up. But the bigger question is, like Jesus said, if unless you repent, you also will perish. You can get caught. You can get caught in the mud over why did such and such thing happen to this one, or why did such and such thing happen to so and so. Missing the point that we can acknowledge that suffering exists. Yet the bigger thing is like this suffering. All suffering here is temporary. Amen. There is a life and death decision. It, you know, literally eternal life hangs in the balance. Mm -hmm. So you think suffering here is bad. Even the worst physical suffering that we can go through here on this earth, it's temporary. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a blip compared to eternity. Um, there's an there's old analogy that, uh, it's called the rope analogy. Basically you have a rope that physically goes on infinitely, but the end of it, the tip, is painted red. Everything that happens in that little red bit determines the rest of the length of where you are in that rope. Mm -hmm. And really, for everyone, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, what you do in this life, how you handle suffering, how you uh, handle that before the Lord, is really going to show where your eternity is. You know, are we going to suffer and give glory to the Lord for it? Or are we going to, you know, uh, suffer, get angry, and walk away from the Lord? Because there's no, there's no right defense with it. Um, and again, guys, that's not to say that suffering doesn't hurt for believers. You know, um, I'm almost 32 years old, and I haven't really been through all that much in my life as far as pain and suffering. I haven't been ravaged by any type of cancer or disease or anything. But, uh, you know, I've been through, through trials, as all of us have in varying degrees, you know. Um, but again, too, that shows the personality and the personal relationship that we have with the Lord. Um, no matter what we go through, we can run to Him, no matter how bad our suffering might be. Um, so again, too, uh, going into verse 13 here. But rejoice. So trials are going to come to the believer, like it says in verse 12. Do not count it strange that these things were happening to you. Verse 13, but rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So this is our reaction as believers. Our reaction to suffering is also to rejoice in them. Paul himself echoes this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And if you know anything about the, the backstory of the Apostle Paul, he was beaten, he was stoned, he, he was left for dead, he you know, had plenty and plenty of scars on his back. Um, you know, everywhere it seems that he went, he was persecuted in some way. Uh, you know, but again, too, that was similar to, to Christ. He did good everywhere he went, and he was, you know, the end result was he was hung on a cross for it, for doing everything sinlessly. 
Well, we know it didn't end there. He was resurrected, praise God. So, but again, too, this should be our attitude, that we may know him in the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What is it that uh, John the Baptist says, you know, um, I must become... Uh, he must increase. Yes, <laughs> thank, thank you. He, he must increase and I must decrease. That should be kind of our general attitude with ourselves, constantly dying to ourselves, constantly putting our flesh to death, our desires, our wants, our... We're dying to ourselves and living for him. May he be, may Christ be reflected more and more in us daily. Um, through suffering, through rejoicing, through everything in between. Um, that's how it should be for the believer, right? So Paul echoes this in, again, verse uh, Philippians 3, 10 through 11. And the disciples also echo this in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. It says, then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, yep. mm -hmm. the name of Christ. So as we share in Christ's sufferings, we rejoice. But then there's the question, why? So that we may also rejoice when his glory is revealed. Peter again echoes this in 1 Peter chapter 1, again, verse 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So in that passage at the end of the revelation of Jesus Christ, is talking about the last day, the second coming. So we go through trials. Everyone goes through trials, but especially as we as believers going through trials, we might not see in the here and now the exact purpose for why, how everything came to be, what the exact, you know, how everything works out for God's glory. We might not know, you know. We don't know every single detail because the secret things belong to the Lord. He doesn't always choose to reveal every single detail about what we might be going through. Right. Yet we know and it can sound kind of trite when we come up to a believer who's really, really hurting. And uh, we just, you know, it's easy to quote like the Romans 8.28. Like, you know, God works all things together for good and, and, uh, and that. And we have to kind of balance that with, again, realizing that, yes, this is glorious. This is a glorious truth and we should rejoice in it. But there's also pain and, and the pain is real. You know, we can't, um, we can't pull like the Christian science approach and uh, just pretend like, oh, whatever we feel isn't, it doesn't exist. It, it's like, no, pain is real for the believer. You know, when, <laughs> even, even Christ, when, when he was on the cross, when he was being scourged, when the nails were being driven to his hands and his feet, it was excruciating pain. Um, I will wristband, I'm not to draw attention to myself, but I have wrist pain. Um, you know, I can't imagine a nail being driven in through here. Right. It's one of the most sensitive, tender spots on the body in the heels likewise. You know, he had nails driven through both those areas. Um, so, again, uh, his glory will be revealed though, and on that day we will understand why we went through everything that we went through. You know, largely, Sorry, guys. I uh, lost my place here. Largely, we know that when he comes, there will be at least some understanding of why we went through these various trials. It's ultimately to bring glory to him in that. So how we react to suffering, how we react to trials is really going to uh, either give glory to God or, or take away from it. It's very easy, even, even for us sometimes as believers, 
we can get caught in this in the self pity rut. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just speaking from personal experience. I am very like largely when I'm first afflicted with some sort of trial or pain, I am not thinking. Lord praise you for this trial. Like, no, that, that, that comes over a little bit of time where, you know, when I have to get, like, okay, Johnny, get over yourself. Like, because ultimately that's what we have to do. It's, all right, Lord, why am I going through this? Is this because of something stupid that I did, that something sinful that, you know, I wasn't aware of or that I am aware of? Or, you know, is it, is it for some larger purpose to bring you glory that I am unaware of? Whatever it may be, show me. You know, that should be our, our reaction to it. So, our joy, though, our joy now, through trials, through even rejoicing through trials, our joy now hints and points forward to the joy that we will have when Christ returns. Amen. Right? So, again, too, momentary and light afflictions. Even a lifelong crippling uh, genetic disease that leaves you wheelchair bound or losing a limb or whatever it might be. Momentary light afflictions as compared to eternity. Painful now, yes. Hard now, absolutely. But in contact, in comparison to eternity, momentary and light afflictions. That should give us joy. So going on to verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Peter says here that if we're insulted for the name of Christ, we are blessed, and indeed we are. Jesus says this, he echoes this exact same thing in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And he echoes a similar thing in John chapter 15, verses 20 through 21. He says, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So we see even into the, into the persecutor's mindset a little bit. Why do they persecute us? Because they don't know the Father. They don't have a relationship or a saving relationship with the Lord. And they're just, they're just reacting on, on their sin nature. So, this is, uh, sorry guys, so why are we insulted, if we're insulted for the name of Christ, we're blessed, right? But why exactly is that? The same spirit that rested on Christ and was with him through every persecution that he went through, rests on those who follow and suffer for him as well. See this in Isaiah 11 too. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's what Christ walked around with. That was the Holy Spirit. And that same spirit that dwells in Christ rests on us. In Matthew 3, uh, verses 16 and 17, we see this at Jesus' baptism. It says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him or hear him. And then what happens exactly after that baptism? Christ is sent by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tested for 40 days and 40 nights. That was the start of his ministry. So if that happened to Christ, it's going to happen to us as well if we follow him, if we're walking with him. If we're walking Christ, suffering and persecution is going to come our way in some degree. We might not, I don't think we could physically stand 40 days and 40 nights without food and water out in the wilderness. Like Christ said, that was a supernatural event. But, you know, we might not be doing something like that, but some degree of, 
of persecution and pain is going to come our way because we bear the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. We're going to be like him in his sufferings as well. Um, yes. Question. Am I allowed to ask? Okay. No. Yes. <laughs> so, it, can suffering come in all different forms, or has to be like a persecution? So, like, like when you're preaching the name of Jesus Christ to, you know, on one on one, and someone's just like, "Oh, you know, you're a Jesus freak." Is that considered like being persecuted, or is that? I mean, there's, as I stated before, there's varying degrees. We here in the states. We're not at the point, say, like in the Middle East, where we're going to lose our heads for, right. you know, our, our faith. But, you know, there could come a time where we lose our jobs for our faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Jesus freak. You know, they can't explicitly lay that out. I guess there's laws against that. But, I mean, yeah, there's, there's varying degrees. It doesn't have to come uh, necessarily because we're vocal about it. Um, but, you know, there's varying degrees of persecution that can come from just anyone who has any type of general animosity towards, towards Christ. If they know, you know, what we're all about, um, it can definitely uh, come upon us and affect us in negative ways, you know, at least as far as like vocation. And, and listen, even taking, a, a, you know, slander is not fun. No, you know, no, nobody likes being being called names. It's hurtful. It's uh, you know, it it's it's painful. And you know, we each, each some of us it can just stick out, whatever. You know, but some of us they can call us a Jesus freak, and it's like in one sense, yeah, that yay. You know, I'm suffering no, yeah, name, but yeah. but at the same time, it, it, it's still like right. wow. Like, listen, we all want to be liked. I mean. You know, we all want to be liked, but there, there's always that line in the sand, especially when you're talking to someone. Like, I, I, I've had to lose friendships over, uh, you know, my, my walk with the Lord because... And that's like a persecution, right? Or I, I, it's a sacrifice. I mean, maybe not in the long run. Because, I mean, if... Th think of, of what Jesus says about, uh, you know... Him bearing a sword, and that you know he's cause he's causing division between uh, father and mother, and, and and all that, and the the family unit. It it can get really muddy and messy when some of your closest loved ones just don't love the Lord, right. or they don't know the Lord, they don't have a saving relationship with the Lord. Um, it, it can be very very difficult, especially in that aspect where there's a. There's a, you feel the strain of that relationship. It can be mended where to a degree where you can be, you know, cordial with each other. You can you can love your family. You know, I'm saying that you can't do that, but there's that line in the sand where you can come so far, but no further, because they need the Lord at that point. Right. You know, I mean, and and that's hard. That's that's I, I've had to do that. I've, I I have lots of family that don't know the Lord and it and it's difficult in that in that aspect and it weighs on you is it a suffering yes is it a persecution I don't it depends on the context but it's definitely a suffering and I carry that because of the Lord I'm not going to give up on the Lord and my relationship with him just because my family doesn't know him if anything I'm going to share that love with them and point them to Christ so that they can experience exactly what we have with him. Because again, too, that little end of the rope that's painted right affects everything, you know, it, it's little life or death, eternal life or death. So we want, to, we want to share what we have with the Lord, with our lost loved ones, you know, so. So in, where am I here, guys? Uh, 15, verse 15. Again, so the Spirit of God rests upon us because it rests on Christ. So that same Holy Spirit rests upon every one of us as believers. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer because, uh, oh, sorry, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. So Peter contrasts this holy type of righteousness that rests on us as we walk with the Spirit, uh, this or this type of righteous suffering as well, with suffering for unholy or unrighteous suffering, because there is a difference. You can be suffering because of stupid, 
sinful choices that you've made or you can be suffering because uh, in a particular context you haven't done anything wrong especially before the Lord and you're just being persecuted by those who don't who don't know Christ um, you know there's there's a huge difference between suffering for the name of Jesus and then suffering for something stupid that we did right you know there's, there's a huge difference um, so if you look at chapter 2, 18 through 20, this is kind of demonstrated. 1 Peter 2, 18 through 21. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and you are beaten for it, you endure it? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. So again, verse 20. What good is it if, if when you sin and you're beaten for it, you endure? What, what good does that do you? That was your own... <laughs> that was, that, yeah, you deserve that. Like, that came out But, again, too, when you suffer... Uh, and you're beaten for it for the name of Christ, yet you endure. That's a gracious thing in the sight of God because you did good. When you're obedient and you suffer for it, that's a blessing. It might not be pleasant, it still hurts. Nobody likes to get beaten, but it's a blessing. And he echoes this also in chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. He says, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. So again, this is our reaction. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. He jumps down to verse 17. For, that. for it is better to suffer for doing good, that it should be God's will, than for doing evil. Mm -hmm. So Lord, if it's your will, may we suffer for doing good and for being obedient to you. Let us not suffer for doing evil. So we should not suffer, again, he lists some examples here, for being murderers, for stealing, for, for being thieves, or just general evil, or even meddling, right? Not minding our own business, getting involved in, in things that we shouldn't have any right to be involved in. Um, there's a bunch of scriptures that talk about busybodies. I uh, think in, in, in gossips, I think in uh, First Timothy specifically, I can't remember the exact uh, chapter and verse, but... They call them busybodies. Basically, they're, they're people who, they're not working, they're not doing any good for themselves. They're just kind of leeching off from everyone else and getting involved in the, the, the town gossip, essentially. They're meddling in everyone else's business that they, have no, they should have no involvement in. Um, and there's people like that. There's plenty and plenty of people like that out in the world that are just, hey, did you hear what so-and-so did? Hey, did you hear about this thing or this thing or this thing? And it... it Pastor Dave says, uh, it's like whenever somebody comes to me with so, some sort of gossip or they have some sort of personal problem, you know, if they're there, I'll be like, yeah, you know, that's a good idea. I, let's go talk to them. And he's like, they'll never come to me ever again. That, that's, a great, that's a great idea. We, it's so good, good hearty advice from, from your pastor. So we should definitely do that. Because again, too, we don't like to deal with it because we can get dragged into that as well if we're giving an ear to it. Right. You know, we don't want to get involved in anybody else's uh, gossip, but it's, it's, the lines can get very kind of muddy sometimes, and it's, it's very easy for us to fall into common sins like that. Um, so going on to verse 16. Again, we want to, we want to be, we want to suffer for righteousness, not for unrighteousness. We want to suffer for the name of Christ and for doing good before him and being obedient not for our sinfulness that can easily bleed through or just doing something stupid before the sight of the lord we don't want to suffer for that that's not righteous suffering that's that's wrong we shouldn't be doing that we should be suffering righteously for the name of christ for being obedient before him and not bending the knee to the to the world because they just simply don't like it or go against it goes against the culture or uh what have you so in verse 16, Peter says, Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, 
but let him glorify God in that name. So Peter says a Christian should glorify God in the name of Christ. And I found this out as I was studying. This is actually the only time in the New Testament that the term Christian isn't used by opponents of believers or in a, uh, in a more negative context. This is the only scripture. Uh, the term was first uh, used actually back in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. It says, and when, he had, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So that's when the term itself is, is coined. But it's also used by Herod Agrippa when uh, Paul is, is before him in Acts chapter 26, verse 28. And Agrippa, obviously Herod Agrippa, uh, he was not a believer. He was the, uh, the ruler of, or one of the, the rulers in Rome at that time. It says in verse 28, And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul was sitting before him and uh, pleading his case before Agrippa. And, you know, apparently he, Agrippa was convinced to a degree because yep. he saw what Paul was trying to do, yet he didn't go, he didn't actually cross the finish line with that. But again, too, that's an enemy, that's an enemy of, of Christ uh, using the term. So... And two, the term itself in the Greek means little Christ or follower of Christ. And if we're a Christian, that's he is who we're following. We are followers of Jesus Christ. So we're walking like him and trying to be more and more like him day by day. So we as Christians, we should suffer in such a way that we bring honor to God and not dishonor. Again, that whole suffering for righteousness sake thing and not suffering for unrighteousness sake. When we sin and we suffer for it, it's hard to say that we're bringing glory to God. You know, we're suffering because we're boneheads. <laughs> you know, uh, is using steal, stealing from Dave, Dave's turn. But so, verse seventeen, guys. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So this is kind of a scary passage when you get to it because you're thinking, wait, Johnny, we're, we're free from judgment. We haven't been, uh, you know, haven't we been saved from the wrath of God? And yeah, we have. We absolutely have. There's not a single drop of wrath uh, left for us. We are just flooded with God's love and mercy because Christ took every drop of wrath on the cross. But there's still a type of judgment meaning a type of separation that's going to come here in the congregation. You read in 1 John where, you know, the whole wolves with sheep's clothing type thing. The, uh, the enemies of, of God, it's, I think it says in 1 John, false teachers are not going to come from largely outside the church. They're going to come from inside. We have to be more wary of, of false teaching inside the church, inside the congregation than we do outside. And this is kind of, I think, what he's alluding here now, you can get onto either, either type of uh, context with judgment. You can have a separation where you're kind of, it, it's almost like separating the wheat or the chaff from the wheat and what have you, the good from the bad in the household of God. Like in the Old Testament, the term uh, was meant, as far as the term household of God, it was largely meant for the temple, the tabernacle, largely the temple when it's established in, uh, in Jerusalem. But now, uh, the term household of God refers to us as God's people since we are his temple. And it says that in First uh, Peter 2, 4 through 10, it says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in the scripture, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But, for us, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession 
that you may proclaim, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And he ends here, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we are now the household of God. Now again, I said before, the, the term of judgment can be used in like the negative or the separation connotation where the wheat and uh, the chaff are being separated or believers and unbelievers are being separated. And you see that happen too when persecution falls in the church. That's when the pressure is put on and you really see kind of Who's the, the true believers and who's the make-believers? Because it's easy to walk with Christ when everything is going really well. But it's very hard. <laughs> yes, in fact. But it's hard when real pain and suffering come on. And it's just like, okay, this is getting serious now. This isn't just an interesting uh, study of scripture. This isn't just, you know, like, this isn't a walk in the park anymore. Um, and... I think that especially this side of the globe, we have largely not been tested in that way yet. And um, it might be coming. I wouldn't be surprised if it's coming. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it does, as scary as that seems to me and probably radiates some type of fear in all of us a little bit, uh, I think that's natural. But ultimately, it's a good thing because it's going to cleanse the ranks, so to speak. You know, we're going to show who's really serious and who's not. And that's the whole point of, of persecution. You're going to have two reactions to it. It's like the gospel. There's no right in the fence. You're either going to be drawn closer to the Lord through your suffering, or you're going to be repelled away from him by it. You know, there's, there's really no, it's, it's like Christ. It's, there's, there's no right in the fence. You know, you're either in or you're out. So there's only two reactions really to suffering. Now, it might not be, you know, again, too, we're all real here. We, we know that suffering is painful and we might not like it initially, but, you know, as we go through it and the Lord blesses us with more and more understanding, he'll, he'll give us the peace to understand, like, to, yes, this is suffering, but I am here in the midst of it. Think of Job, right? <laughs> when, we're, when we're ministering to, to people, I always like to quote uh, or to cite Job and what happens there because Job has go, Job has lost his family he's covered in, in boils and uh, you know scraping his, his skin with uh, shards of broken pottery you know he's lost all of his, his uh, land and riches and all that and his wife even is you know the mouth of Satan cur curse God and die he has a bunch of friends that come around him and they have pity on him they see him and they're like oh my. They, they they don't know what to say because they see how how uh you know ravaged he is and how much he's suffering and they sit with him in total silence for seven days and as soon as they open their mouths they, everything like <laughs> falls apart so like if I, sometimes like if I if I'm with somebody or if somebody's even with me and I'm going through a really hard time I'm literally like broken hearted over something I don't need anybody to necessarily say anything I just need somebody to be there mm -hmm. that's, right. that's what Joe needed yeah. he didn't need his friends to give their counsel because the minute they opened their mouths they they didn't understand why he was going through what he was going through and likewise when we're going uh, through trial we don't understand what someone else is going through or why these things are necessarily happening to them. So sometimes the best thing that we can do as believers is just be there and be quiet. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, a hand on the shoulder with a, with a light squeeze is, is better than, you know, hey man, that was really stupid. You shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, uh, sucks that you have such and such disease. You know what I mean? Like, we can really botch things and be very un unhelpful as soon as we open our mouths rather than just physically be there and just knowing that someone's there is going to be more helpful largely than anything that we can say because mm -hmm. no matter what we say the pain is still going to be there and they're right. still going to be in the midst of the trial yeah. so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so again to this concept of judgment though that peter says it shall begin in the household of god this actually alludes to um Ezekiel chapter 9 verses 1 through 6 and Malachi uh, verses 3 1 through 4 I'm not going to go there but basically just to recap what happens in Ezekiel it's uh, there was a slaughter in Jerusalem so uh, again too in the Old Testament the household of God referred to the temple it, uh, a note from my ESV Bible says a team of seven angels which is just a summary of the event in Ezekiel 
A team of seven angels carries out the execution of the unfaithful in Jerusalem at God's command. And only one of those angels is assigned the job of protecting the faithful. The prophet Ezekiel's anguish intervention does not dissuade God from judgment. And they cross-reference the Passover. Uh, so, again, too, the household of God cleansing the ranks. Suffering is going to do that. It's going to show us who's the make-believers and who's the true believers who's really walking uh, with the Lord. So God's putting us through the melting pot, essentially. It's like as gold and it uh, needs to be you know, heated up and, and melted down to get rid of the dross and, and all that. It's going to be purified through that fiery, uh, the, the, that heat. Heat is going to purify them. <laughs> Um, and likewise, fiery trials are going to purify us. It's going to cleanse our flesh, our flesh from us. You know, li like fire literally would cleanse your flesh off of your body. Spiritually speaking, it's going to cleanse your sinfulness from you as you walk closer to the Lord in trials. Um, we die to ourselves literally through that. So our judgment is redemptive and not destructive for the believer. Our persecution, our suffering, it's all, the purpose of it is redemptive because it's righteous suffering. It's not unrighteous suffering. Say is we're suffering for our sin. That's, that's destructive. That's punitive or, or punishment. It's not, uh, it's, there's no redemptive purpose in that. Like it, for the unbeliever in the lake of fire, in, in hell, they are not going, their, their punishment is just straight punitive. There's no, there's no redeeming quality of that. They're going to be made for a body that is meant for over and over and over destruction. Uh, whereas we, we will be raised to life and be in eternal glory. And not by anything that we have done, not by how well we have suffered, not by anything, but solely based on what the Lord has done for us. Amen. Praise God. So, if we are cleansed, what happens to those who do not obey and reject Christ? Again, punitive judgment. Suffering, eternal suffering, which none of us want. And again, too, like we reference our friends and family who don't know the Lord. We don't want them to go through that. We don't want our worst enemy to go through that. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if you, if you check out the, the Psalms, they have what's called the imprecatory Psalms, which they're kind of really the, the hard-hitting, really heavy-handed psalms where, you know, Lord, break their teeth of my enemies and, and those type of psalms where there's, there's, there's a place for them. But, you know, it, it's usually based off of because uh, they're wicked, you know. But even still, I, I'm very much a politics junkie. I don't wish eternal hell on anyone who doesn't jive with my politics or whoever's in the White House or, you know, whether or whatever, whatever enemy I have, political, otherwise, spiritual, I don't, we as believers do, shouldn't want anyone to go to hell Amen. and to suffer. Right. Like, like I, since I've been a believer, I, I used to tell people go to hell, like all the time. Me, just, just throwing it out there. You know, as as like just a phrase, and I didn't understand the weight of it until I became a believer. I would never say that now because I understand the weight of that. Right. And I always tell people like, if you think about the weight of hell, and you think about what hell will be like, is hell really going to be fire? I don't know. I know the scripture calls it that. I don't know if it's figured it otherwise, but I, I think that whether it is or not, it's going to be worse than anything that we can ever. And this, the worst suffering and pain that we as believers have here is the closest to hell we will ever get. Right. Yet the greatest joy for the unbeliever that they have here is the closest to heaven they will ever have. Mm -hmm. So we as believers should be more geared to getting them to be with where we will be as believers than leaving them to their own. You know, leaving them in their sin. So, verse 18. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? That's not to say that the, the righteous barely make it or uh, anything like that. That's actually Peter quoting from uh, Proverbs 11, uh, 31, which says, If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Which kind of goes hand in hand. If, if the righteous, for their... 
uh, good deeds are repaid on earth, how much more so the wicked and the sinners. So if blessings come to us for doing good, right, how much more in the head of the sinner is going to fall on them in this life for them doing evil? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, again, too, we have that, that other problem. Why, why do good things happen to bad people? Or why do they, you know, you see it in the Psalms all the time. Why do the wicked prosper, you know, and, and, and the righteous are, are downtrodden? You know. Because the just, the sun rises on the just and the unjust. Yes, right? common grace. Yes, okay. absolutely. But, you know, it's true. It, that, that to us, in our perspective here on earth, it seems backwards. It's like, again, to that problem of evil. If God is good, why do good things happen to bad people? Well, there's, or uh, bad things happen to good people. There's no good people. <laughs> we're all fallen. We're all sinners. <laughs> uh, yeah. we're, we're, all, we're all sinful and fallen. I mean, from, right. from birth, the scripture says, you know, we all have a sin nature. Since uh, after Genesis 3, after the fall of, of Adam and Eve in the garden, we're all born wicked. It's a miracle and we happen. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's not, it's not uh, like people say, oh, well, why, why did God only make one way to heaven? So why did he make any? Right. You understand? Like he he is one hundred percent just after the fall to have let Adam and Eve procreate and right. you know and all that stuff and just sure. not have any any redemption involved at all. He could have just left them to their own devices and we would have just gone straight on to be eternally separated from them. Uh, you know. So so Peter echoes again verse seventeen. That we just came off of in 18. Again, he echoes Proverbs 11.31 here. And uh, it, that whole concept, if the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner, it kind of echoes, you know, what one sows, they will also reap. You know, the seeds that we lay here, we're going to reap some sort of, of thing. If we're reaping sin, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bear sin. If we're reaping for righteousness, we're going to have a fruit of that. Um, Again, too, it says that phrase, scarcely saved, does not mean that believers barely make it or that uh, final salvation, our final salvation is called into question. But actually, if you go into the Greek, the word scarcely means, uh, you know, like in quotations, with difficulty. So again, too, we're going to get there to the finish line, but it's going to be through difficulty, through suffering. It's going to be hard. What, like, what's Christ say? Narrow is the gate. Mm -hmm. You know, and hard is the way, yet broad is the road that leads to destruction. It's easy to be an unbeliever. I remember before I was I was saved, I didn't have a care in the world about, you know, everything. Now I'm thinking about my relationships and, you know, spiritual deep things like that. And I'm like, this is for following the Lord. You know, I, I've had to sacrifice people in my life for following the Lord and, and the mm -hmm. things that I want to do. I have to, I have to think about the music that I listen to now. Because, you know, is this glorifying to the Lord or not? When I was an unbeliever, I just did whatever I wanted. Right. You know? Right. That was living for me. It's, it's not the case anymore as believers. So, going into verse 19, guys, to wrap up. He says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So to recap, guys, why do we suffer trials? It says it here, because of the will of God. In Psalm 31, 5, it says, this is, you'll see. Into your hand I commit my spirit, and you have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. That's echoed by Christ on the cross. Into your hand I commit my spirit when he gave up the ghost, as it said. That should be our attitude. Into your hand, Lord, we commit our spirits. Amen. You have redeemed us, O oh Lord, our faithful God. Amen. So we suffer and we go through persecution because of the will of God. And he rules sovereignly over every single event that happens to us. So taking that problem of evil, well, why is this bad thing happening to me? And, and how, how can God be all good, yet these terrible things are happening to me? Well, praise God that he's sovereign over those terrible things that are happening to you. Because if he wasn't, you should have no hope. If you believe in a God that isn't sovereign over every aspect of your life, that's troublesome. 
Because <laughs> that's calling it to good. That, that's saying that God doesn't know about this thing or why this thing's happening. He's not in control over something. And if he's not in control over every single thing, he's, he, he's not worthy to be God. He's all powerful. Right? Calls him to very question the nature of God with that. Now, we might not understand why these things are happening, but we know that he has a purpose in every single thing that happens. Think, think of, the, of the fall. Get, get, we're going to get heavy for a second. Think, think of the fall in the garden, right? It, it says that that was an evil thing that happened. Sin entering into the world. That ruins, that, that, put, us, that put us here. That put death in, in to this, the spin of things. Uh, you know, decay, all the effects of, of the fall, our, our aging, our getting older, and our bodies, you know, falling apart. That's all consequences of the fall, and we see the earth again is growing. It's, you know, you see everything decaying. Everything is in a state of, of uh, decomposition, literally, and just falling apart because of sin. And that's the, that's the, the noetic effects of the fall, they call it. Um, but we also see the hand of God in that. And what is Christ called? He's called the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. So before the garden was even made, the purpose of God was in effect that knowing that that thing was going to happen according to plan, Christ was going to come through all the mess of humanity and the whole genealogy that Christ has to, you know, and all the events in between in Scripture, uh, all the evil, wicked things that happen. Christ still comes through as the Messiah, and the Lord uses all of it to provide a Redeemer to correct the fall of man in the garden. You, you look in the book of Revelation at the end, the new heaven and new earth is the Garden of Eden perfected, where there's not even, where in the garden there was the possibility of sin entering in. In the new heavens and new earth in eternity, there's no possibility of that. Sin is totally wiped away. Even the, 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 the presence, the power, and uh, even the, the chance that it could re reoccur again, it's gone. And <laughs> that's what we have to look forward to and praise God for that. That's awesome. And if you think of that, we can't even wrap our minds around that concept because every single thing that we think of is tainted by sin in some degree. You know, th think of never having a sinful thought. I, I always tell people, if, you're if you want to see how wonderful and amazing Christ's work is as far as keeping the law, think of it this way. It doesn't, I, I can understand him not indeed acting on anything. So he was sinless in the flesh, right? But he was also sinless in the mind. Mm -hmm. He never had a sinful thought, Amen. ever. Amen. Ever. Amen. Everything was done perfect. No, it's true though. Never a sinless thought. His, like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is the only one that ever did that. Amen. We don't have the capacity to. Yeah, I think someone had a question. No, like, you know how, like, he, he is, like, before the foundation, like, he was up there with the Father. And said, like, okay, well, him and the Father. He's like, okay, well, now's the time to go down there. Right. And he came down as a man mm -hmm. and was perfect indeed and did everything as he only did what he saw the Father and only spoke what he heard the Father saying, right? Mm -hmm. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, he mm -hmm. said he was sinless, right. right? And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's like praying and he's like, you know, not my will, Father, but your will be done. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, what if this coach, like, you know, if this be like, I. But it's just cup shall pass, but not mm -hmm. my father, but your will be done. You know, and it's like he knew what had to be done, right. and yet still he was like, oh, you know, oh, it just shows like it was the anguish. Yes, right. and yet he still knew what had to be, and he right. he was still obedient unto the Father. It was like, yeah. just shows his identification with man. Yeah, right. absolutely. And still obedience to the Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. So guys, if we suffer according to his will, we must entrust our souls to him who is faithful and to do good. And by so doing, we will reflect the life of Christ as he trusted the Father through suffering and continued to do good. So in all those things, in our suffering, may we reflect Christ 
and really echo him in his ministry and his life by going through similar persecution that he went through. So guys, let's suffer for doing well and not because we're just boneheads. Let's not suffer for our own sinfulness, but let's suffer for our obedience before the Lord, especially with the culture being as crazy as it is and, and things getting day by day seemingly darker. Let's suffer for doing good and suffer for, uh, for Christ, for his name, not our own. So guys, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, again for your word for this time tonight, Father. And uh, Lord, thank you for our salvation that we have in you. Thank you for, for Christ that, Lord, by sending your son, you gave us a, an example, a perfect example of how to live, Lord. May we, Father, reflect your son and your glory in all that we do, even suffering through persecution, Lord. May we suffer for your name and not because of our own sinfulness, Lord. Help us, Lord, and help those around the world who are doing the same in greater ways. So help us, Lord, to reflect to you and to live for your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.